We sing the song there, Oh, once I had a glorious view of my redeeming Lord. We can't always be on the mountaintop. A lot of times we're going to be down in the valley. A lot of times we're going to feel low. We're going to feel despaired. We're going to feel like the Lord is hiding his smiling face from us. Many times uh, it's from the usual and customary manner and ways of just living in this old sin-cursed world. And then there are times that the Lord uh, in his wisdom... Um, blesses us to go through troubles and trials and situations to strengthen us and to cause us to depend upon him and to trust him uh, more and more. But what shall I do? Shall I lie down? Shall I despair? No, he will put his strength in me. And when I'm tried sufficiently, I shall come forth as gold. You know, I... I really wouldn't want to sing that song if it went for the last verse. <laughs> but, uh, but, and I, I hope you understand what I mean by that. But I do thank the Lord for that last verse. I thank the Lord that uh, there's a time then that he does give us of his strength and of his, of his grace and of his help. The Lord Jesus Christ is our example to follow in everything. And brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus Christ was not a superhuman. He was a man made like unto his brethren. He overcame and he performed the preaching of the gospel and the miracles that he did by the same way that we will overcome and that we will triumph in this life in the way of duty and discipleship is by the power of the Spirit. How that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Now he had the Spirit without measure. We understand that. But thank God though we do have a measure. Amen of the Spirit. And He has not left us as orphans. He has not left us comfortless. He has given us of His Spirit. The, uh, Brother Peter, by the unction of the Spirit, said that the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of Christ. Jesus said that He would come back unto them. And He came back unto them through the Holy Ghost. And He is with the church. Amen. By His Spirit today. And how appreciative that we should be of that. I invite you to turn back with me to Romans chapter 10. And we're going to just uh, pick, pick up there with verse 13. There's a few more things I'd like to say upon this verse and bring some other thoughts in and of course our whole foundation we've already been four Sundays uh, on these 13 verses and so uh, if you'll count back and, and, and think and remember but uh, for the sake of time though I'm not going to read any of those verses previously let's just begin here with verse 13 for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm thankful for that verse. I'm thankful for uh, the instruction in what God's Word uh, plainly teaches us here. For whosoever, Jew or Gentile. And last Sunday, toward the end, uh, we were in the book of Joel where we have uh, the first prophetic utterance and reference and where the Apostle Paul takes this from. And of course, the Apostle Peter took it from Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. But the prophet Joel, he signified and, and he prophesied and, and foretold of a specific time. And uh, that time 
time is set forth uh, uh, there as we went over with the darkening of the moon and the darkening of the sun and the stars not giving forth the light, the light going out uh, uh, as far as in the old economy and the old uh, uh, nation, the old law, worship type service. Uh, that light was going out and the light of the new and living way uh, was burning brightly. And the focus upon that, uh, the order that Jesus was establishing and setting up uh, here upon this earth and foretold at that time that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And of course that's what the apostle uh, Peter stood up uh, there in Acts chapter 2 uh, and he told them that this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, saith God, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Uh, this is the way the apostle Peter began that great discourse uh, there in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Uh, when those that began to hear uh, the noise, uh, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together. There was a great stirring going on at the upper room. There was a commotion. There was a noise. Uh, uh, there was something happening there uh, that was peculiar and strange. And a multitude of people began together. And they began to accuse them of being drunk. Uh, these, uh, and, and that's what Peter stood first and said, These are not drunk as ye suppose. In other words, they're not under the influence of what you think they're under the influence of. They thought they were under the influence of wine, uh, of alcohol, if you please. Uh, but it's the third hour of the day. It's just 9 a.m. in the morning. Uh, these are not drunk, as you suppose. I want you to notice he didn't say they weren't drunk. He said they are not drunk, as ye suppose. They were intoxicated. Amen. What were they intoxicated on? They were intoxicated on the Spirit. And, and the Apostle Paul, amen, uh, br brings that in to the Ephesian church and settles it with them and says, Be not drunk with wine, words in excess, uh, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, amen. Uh, don't be intoxicated uh, with worldly things. Don't be intoxicated with the affairs uh, and the carrying on of the world uh, that will pull you down into the mire and to the dredges of it uh, and its influence upon you. But be filled with the Spirit and have the influence of the Spirit uh, in your life. Uh, oh, that we could live and walk uh, by the very Spirit of God. So he said, these are not drunk as you suppose, being it's the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then of course, uh, uh, the apostle Peter went on to say, and then in verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, amen. He picks up the banner uh, that brother Joel uh, had waved uh, many hundred years before, for this was the day, this was the time of the Pacific of the fulfilling of this uh, that whosoever Jew or Gentile and thank God uh, amen that, that the gospel kingdom uh, was coming and was going to shine uh, unto uh, the Gentiles. Uh, matter of fact uh, you can read the very last verses uh, of the Acts uh, of the Apostles uh, uh, there in, in chapter 28 uh, the very last uh, verses that we have uh, uh, where it tells us uh, that in verse 30 and 31 uh, and Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house uh, and received all that came in unto him uh, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ uh, with all confidence. Uh, no man forbidding him. Uh, the apostle Paul, amen, uh, first and foremost was a preacher uh, and he was a sent preacher. And of course, uh, uh, we'll get into that uh, in just a moment. Uh, but the Lord gave 
gave him the light and understanding that he would be sent. Uh, there in Acts chapter 22, uh, uh, it says that he would be sent uh, unto the Gentiles. Uh, and certainly he was. You know, the very name apostle means sent ones. Uh, the Bible says of John the Baptist that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Uh, the Bible says in John chapter 6 in one place uh, where Jesus said for uh, I came down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him that sent me. John was sent. Jesus was sent. The apostle Paul was sent. And then all uh, of the apostles by the very name apostle means sent ones. And they are sent, amen, to preach Jesus Christ. To preach the things concerning Christ so that the people of God, Jews and Gentiles, uh, that if they would believe on Christ and confess Him, uh, not only with their mouth, but in their life, uh, with their direction of life, uh, uh, believing in their heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, then there's a salvation that they would have. And we know it's not a salvation for heaven and mortal glory, but it's a salvation of deliverance uh, while we live right here in this life. Now, I want you to notice also here in Acts chapter 2 after the Apostle Paul had preached uh, uh, that there were uh, many of God's uh, uh, children there on that day and they were listening and they were hearing uh, and they were pricked uh, in uh, their heart uh, and they cried out. Uh, uh, notice uh, uh, what they said in verse 37. Now when they heard this in Acts 2, uh, they were pricked in their heart. What does that mean? That means that they were cut, amen, to the heart. Amen. They were pricked in the heart. They were uh, pricked. They, they were cut. They felt condemnation. Uh, they felt a mighty stirring and a mighty guilt uh, in their seat of affection, in that new creature. Amen. Christ in, the, in them the hope of glory. Peter wasn't preaching that day to get folks saved for heaven and mortal glory. Amen. He was preaching to get some Jews saved. Amen. For the kingdom of God to become disciples of the Lord. To move from ignorance to light, from darkness to light in understanding. Oh, and to come into the gospel church. And you know, uh, it happened that day. There were 3,000 souls added to the church. There were 3,000 that submitted to water baptism. Uh, they had done uh, what we read and talked about uh, back there in Romans chapter 10 and uh, verse 3, uh, the latter part of that, uh, where he said, uh, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. But I tell you that there was 3,000 uh, individuals on the, of Jews on the day of Pentecost uh, that submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Uh, not in order to get righteous. Uh, they were righteous. They had imputed righteousness. Uh, amen. But they, uh, amen, uh, uh, were going to have that that would be counted unto them for righteousness. Uh, Oh, just as the Bible says of Abraham that he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness, for right doing. Oh, uh, thank God. You know, that's uh, uh, not hard to understand. Uh, you just have to muddy that up. And as I've said many a times, there's plenty of folks to help you do it. Amen. But, but it was uh, uh, credited to him. It was counted unto him for righteousness. Oh, he was blessed in that way of obedience when he followed and become a discipleship in the way of the most high God. That's what Abraham was becoming. Oh, when God called him out of error, Chattadee, he become a disciple of God. He is already a child of God. He is a child of God in ignorance. Amen. He is a child of God in darkness. Yeah. There in Ur, Chattadee. But when God called him out. Amen. God called him out. Amen. Preached the gospel to him. Oh, in types and figures. Amen. And she came along. He became more and more. Faith came more and more. Rising up within him. And that's what Paul was talking about. As he got on down. 
in Romans chapter 10. And faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Thank God we have his word today. We have preaching it. Whereby to encourage and strengthen us uh, in the faith. Now back here in Acts chapter 2. So when they were pricked in the heart and they cried out. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? In other words, based upon this, this load of guilt, this feeling of guilt that we've got inside, we've been cut into the heart. We, we, we're, we're pricked inside in our spiritual nature. So uh, what should we do in response to it? I believe that every time uh, God's children said under the sound of the gospel uh, and the gospel is preached and brought forth unto us, uh, uh, we make decisions. Uh, as we sit under the sound of the gospel, uh, uh, we, we go in directions uh, uh, based upon the word of God, either in a way of obedience or in a way of disobedience. Uh, they were brought to a crossroad. They were brought to a fork in the road. Uh, and uh, what they're saying is based upon what you just preached, based upon how we feel inside what should we do yeah. what should we do amen. thank God brother Peter he told them what they ought to do yeah. amen he didn't beat around the bush about it no, he, didn't. Oh, uh, uh, he didn't tell them what they shouldn't do he told them what they ought to do yeah. amen the command for them to do based upon what he had just preached to them. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now notice, I'd like to, uh, if, if, if time per permitting, I'd, I'd like to speak several moments on that, but time uh, doesn't permit. I've got to move on down. But where I want to go is into verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation, from this crooked generation, this perverse generation. Save yourself. Right. Amen. Now, he, the Scripture interprets itself. How would they save themselves from this untoward generation? What generation is under consideration? It's that last generation. That's the same ones that John the Baptist had spoken of and said to those Pharisees, to those religious leaders when they came out to his baptism. And, uh, uh, and, and John the Baptist said to them, uh, uh, Who hath warned you to flee the wrath to come? Oh, he wasn't talking about an everlasting hell there. Amen. I believe with all my heart he's talking about the wrath of God that's coming upon the nation of Israel. Who has warned you to flee the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruit me for repentance. Uh, in other words, you haven't heard uh, the preaching of the gospel. You haven't heard these things. Who has warned you to flee the wrath? You don't understand about the wrath that is coming. You don't understand what is taught from the prophets and what they have said and so forth. You bring for some fruit, some evidence before I will baptize you. Right. And uh, he said, old generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee the wrath to come? So that's that generation. And then of course, uh, Jesus uh, spoke to that last generation when he said that their house was left unto them desolate. And he said, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Those things that Jesus was teaching and preaching there in Matthew chapter 23 and 24 and other places and other gospels. Amen. And said this generation will not pass. That generation that he was looking eyeball to eyeball with and said they would not pass until the fulfillment of these things of God's judgment and of the wrath that John the Baptist had preached and said the axe is laid to the root of the tree. He was talking about uh, the divine judgment of God and the cutting off uh, uh, of the nation of Israel uh, uh, from uh, the divine protection and providential uh, care of God and uh, amen God's dealing and God's oracles, God's sayings, God's commandments and the gospel uh, being preached uh, to the Gentiles. 
So he tells them, uh, by you repenting and being baptized, coming in and having fellowship to the fellowship. And that's the way they would come in to the fellowship of the local gospel body of believers. Amen. Through water baptism. And uh, that they would uh, be identified and they would fall the meek and lowly lamb whithersoever he goeth uh, that they would follow Jesus Christ uh, and his sayings uh, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them remember that uh, back over in Luke chapter 6 uh, where he had likened them uh, amen like a man that dug down and threw and got on the rock uh, and built the house uh, and when the wind blew uh, and the rain came and so forth uh, uh, it stood uh, oh but if we don't hear his sayings and do them uh, then were likened to the man that just built the house upon the sand and it shifted and moved or oh, at the least a little bit of wind and turmoil that's the way with our lives we need to hear his sayings and do his sayings not only be hearers of the word but to be doers of the word of God and in doing so we will save ourselves from the downfalls and the judgment uh, that comes upon the crooked and perverted untoward generation. Amen. And, uh, and, 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 and many, many, many of God's children comprise that number that's in uh, that midst of that crooked. I tell you, uh, there were many of God's children, uh, many of them uh, numbered in that crooked and perverse generation, that generation of disobedience, uh, uh, that generation uh, that was going to turn a deaf ear and a blinded eye and wouldn't give heed uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, but Peter uh, is telling these, that if heard and the gospel has done something for them not gospel regeneration because they were already regenerated amen already born of the spirit of God but the gospel is to make disciples and that's what Jesus told those apostles when he told them to go into all the world amen he told them to teach and, uh, and baptize, make disciples uh, of all men, Jews and Gentiles. I mean, what he was saying was uh, uh, through the gospel, the gospel is going to make uh, disciples. I tell you what, God makes uh, uh, sheep and God borns uh, his sheep again. Uh, and therefore then, uh, as he has worked in them, the two will and the two do, uh, uh, the gospel can benefit and bless Yes, uh, uh, he is born again people here in this life uh, and become disciples, followers uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's the whole thing that the Apostle Paul is teaching uh, and specifically to uh, the Jews uh, there in Romans chapter 10 uh, that they would become disciples, uh, that they would be saved from that ignorance and that darkness and become disciples uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank God for that. I want to turn uh, back in the Old Testament to Jeremiah chapter 33. I want to, want to all go ahead and tie in as we've already given you that uh, witness of Joel and that time frame, that setting. You know, there, there's, no, there's no doubt uh, at the scripture plainly when you tie Joel's prophecy in and then the preaching of the apostle Peter uh, in Acts chapter 2, uh, the fulfillment of what Joel had prophesied and then that what we just went over there in Acts chapter 2. But now let's look also when God dealt uh, with the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 33. And notice particularly verse 3. We can start with one but for the sake of time. I, I invite you to always later on read above and below and so forth. But in verse 3 he said call unto me and I will answer thee. And show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now I want to say just a couple of things 
hear about this. First of all, I turn here because the Lord says to Jeremiah, Call unto me. Yeah. Now there is a deliverance that can come to Jeremiah by calling on the Lord. And, and I believe that this is specifically right here. Now the principle is broad. But the actual context uh, of this is to Jeremiah. In other words, God is not saying unto Israel or, or Judea, uh, uh, Zion. Uh, when he's saying, call unto me and I will answer thee. I, I believe he, he is speaking in context to Jeremiah here. Because the... The, the, the word will interpret itself because what God says, uh, Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now Jeremiah knew a lot of things. Jeremiah had been prophesying a lot of things. He, he had already prophesied and foretold and taught about the, the captivity and all of those type of things. Many, many things that, that he had seen, many things that a, a, a door of entrance had been open of his understanding for, for him to know and to see clearly. But it's very plain right here that the Lord says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. There are some things, Jeremiah, you don't know. There are some things that can deliver you out of your current attitude, out of your, your current frame of mind, that can be a great blessing to you if you know them. Yeah. And this is what God says. He says, you call, call on me and I'll answer you. And I'll show you these great and mighty things that you do not know. I tell you, there are many of God's children that need to call on the Lord and find out some things. And to pray for God to open up and to give understanding and give light and give illumination. Whereby they could be delivered out of their present state of mind of confusion and darkness. And realize of a hope. Realize of an expected end. <laughs> Amen. I'm going somewhere with this. Oh, I want you to really think about this right here now. Yeah. Jeremiah. You've seen a lot of wonderful things and you're seeing the captivity. You foretold that, but there's some things that can bless you. There's some things that can elevate you. There's some wonderful things uh, that you do not know. I will show thee great and mighty things. I would to God that some of God's children today could see some mighty things. Amen. Could see some wonderful things uh, instead of sitting uh, on the dung hills uh, uh, of ignorance and darkness uh, uh, that the nominal uh, church world and, and uh, these so-called preachers out here uh, 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 that haven't taught the light and the illumination and the truth as it is in Christ Jesus uh, and God's people are perishing in a timely sense uh, because of lack of knowledge. Yeah. Amen. Because of the lack of understanding. So God says to Jeremiah, you call on me and I'll show thee. I'll show thee great and mighty things. Things that you haven't seen yet, Jeremiah. Yeah. Things that you can see. What would, what would they be? And then I'll show you further than you're seeing now. You, you've seen the, uh, the dreaded things. You, you've, you've seen and you've preached and you've prophesied. But I'll show you some glorious things. All beyond this. I'll show you God's people being delivered. And then I'll show you uh, about how that David's throne will not, will not want a man. Uh, that's what the, the language of the scripture says. Uh, uh, in other words, will not lack a man. A man will not fall. A man will not fail. Uh, matter of fact, we can turn just a little bit further in this and, and read it. And I'll get there in just a moment. But uh, for the sake of time, I invite you to read all of this on down uh, here and, and below this. But uh, uh, I believe evidently, amen, that Jeremiah obeys. And he begins to call on the Lord. And the Lord begins to deliver him and to show him some great things and some mighty things and things that, uh, that he begins to see. 
Uh, uh, notice in verse 15 and 16. In those days, and at that time, will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. Oh, that's why I believe Brother Jeremiah obeyed the Lord, and he started calling on the Lord and asking the Lord to show him these great and mighty things. Amen, because he starts writing them down. Amen. He starts writing them down. Oh, and he talks about the days and the time. Uh, that there's going to come a time. Uh, I, I will cause the branch of righteousness. Who is this branch of righteousness? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ. So here, Brother Jeremiah showed a time. He showed a day uh, when uh, the, the righteousness incarnate. Amen. When, when the, the, the uh, righteous uh, personified of uh, the person Jesus Christ is going to come. Uh, Zechariah. I'm not going to take time to turn over there and to read it. it, it it's familiar probably to most of you. Uh, but you remember how that the Lord Lord uh, told uh, Zechariah and the folks uh, to take uh, the son uh, of the high priest and to make crowns and put on his head. Uh, and they made him of gold and silver and they put him on his head signifying a king priest. A king priest. Oh, and what did they call him? They called him the branch. Amen. The branch. And this ties into this right here. You, you see in the Old Testament there, uh, the, the only one that we have a uh, record of Melchizedek. Amen. Who was a king priest. Uh, uh, as far as the others and far as Israel and so forth, uh, those there, there were three offices. There was king and priest and prophet. Uh, uh, and and I, I don't remember reading about another king priest. I remember a king that's called a prophet. Peter called David a prophet in Acts chapter 2. So there you have a king and prophet combined. Uh, I read of Samuel who is a priest and, and uh, he is a prophet, a priest and a prophet but not a king priest. Man, I want to tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ is the king priest. Yeah. He, uh, he's the branch. And uh, so in those days and at that time, will I cause the branch of, the, of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment. Justice. Justice. Well, oh, I tell you what, the Lord Jesus Christ in preaching His everlasting... You know, the Old Testament is full, amen, of teaching about judgment, uh, discerning, and uh, justice, and executing uh, justice, uh, and uh, treating uh, the uh, individuals and the poor having just weights and balances. Uh, I could go on and on with that, but God is a God of justice. And, uh, uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ in His Gospels, uh, He taught a gospel of justice. Amen. He taught that. Uh, and, and so, uh, here when, when He says, uh, and He shall execute judgment, justice, uh, and righteousness in the land. When Christ was here uh, upon this earth, uh, I want to tell you, He executed uh, justice. Uh, and he gave forth commandments of justice uh, in the New Testament church. He's a lawgiver. Uh, uh, we, we see uh, all of these principles from the old uh, that he brought over into the new, into his kingdom, uh, and taught his apostles. Uh, and they are uh, foundational. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, uh, is the chief cornerstone. Uh, uh, yes, he is uh, the foundation. Uh, uh, but I read in Acts 2, uh, and verse 19 and year founded upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone oh and upon that city amen underneath are 12 foundation and the names of the apostles are written upon them I tell you that's the gospel church brothers and sisters that's the gospel church of the Lord Jesus Christ so uh, uh, the Apostle Paul in his teachings, in his letters, uh, 
Uh, you can read justice in there. I mean, you can read of justice uh, uh, that is uh, uh, so balanced out. Uh, I, I tell you, I believe that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of what Jeremiah is writing here and uh, of him calling on the Lord and the Lord showing him great and mighty things that he didn't know. Well, Brother David, never thought about it like that. Well... I want you to give it some consideration. Amen. Consider it. And the Lord give us understanding. Let's go on. Verse 16. Got some more of that language. In those days shall Judah be saved. <laughs> and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called. Not the, not the Lord. He, he's, already, he's already told us about him. He. He's going to execute this righteousness. He's, he's the branch of righteousness to grow up. But she shall be called. Who's the she? Amen. This is the gospel kingdom. This is the church. This is the church. Amen. Oh, she shall be called the right, the Lord, my righteous. The Lord, our righteous. The Lord, our righteous. I will say that this morning. Oh, oh. If my people which are called by my name. You know, I know that that has just got to be a verse that's just thrown around a lot. But I tell you, the underlining part right there is not just my people. But if my people which are called by my name. And here, she shall be called the Lord our righteous. I'll, I'll take that name, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I pray to God that we'd be called that name. Yeah. I pray to God that there'd be enough evidence to convict us of it. Amen. If we was tried in the court of law, there'd be enough evidence to convict us. Amen. Of the Lord, our righteous. And that goes right back to Romans 10. Amen. Where he says that I bear them witness, they be an ignorant of God righteousness going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves into the righteousness of God. Amen. So the Lord is our righteous one. That's for heaven and immortal glory. Amen. I, he, he is our right doing. In other words, he did everything right. Now that's a one liner. That's, that's, that's kind of like uh, you got to be there, okay? <laughs> Amen. That, that was one of these little fellas. That's what he got out of two Sundays, two hours worth of sermons on the gathering together of the church. <laughs> Amen. You got to be there. <laughs> and that was good. Amen. That, that's a good one liner. Yeah. All right. I, I did the, the one liner. Amen. Uh, uh, here is, uh, Amen, for heaven and more of glory, the Lord is our right. Amen. And our our righteous one, he hath done that which is right. Amen. He hath fully satisfied all that God demanded. All that God's righteousness demanded. All that God's purity, all that God's holiness. And instead of continuing on with all of God's character and attributes, I'll just say with all with God's totality of his nature. Amen. With the totality of his nature. Amen. Jesus Christ took care of that. Now, no, let's, let's go on with this. Because I believe that verse 15 and 16 by those expressions in those days at that time. Verse 16, in those days, in those days. I believe it's the same days that Peter said of Joel, this is that. Yeah. which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I believe it can be said the same way of this time here. Amen. It's that uh, that Jer Brother Jeremiah amen, was talking about. Listen to verse 17. And it's in this same context here. Uh, and it's at the same time. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Now, we know in Acts chapter 2 that the Apostle Peter, uh, 
replaces Jesus Christ, the Son of David, sitting upon the throne of David. All right, the Apostle Peter handles that so beautifully there in Acts chapter 2. So at this time, here is the man. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Now notice he says Israel. And, and it's no mistake there. It, and it's no happenstance. Let me, let me use that. It's no happenstance that he uses Israel right there instead of Judah. Instead of just saying Judah. Now, now we know that a lot of the identity of the ten northern kingdoms... Uh, a lot of the identity uh, has been lost by the time that Christ comes on the scene. And there's more identity of the southern kingdom of Judah. And Christ, of course, comes out of Judah. Uh, for that uh, uh, being Judah uh, and, and Benjamin, uh, those, nation, those tribes of the southern kingdom. But he says, shall sit upon uh, the throne of the house of Israel. There's only two men that rule upon the throne of Israel until their death, and that was David and Solomon. It was in Solomon's son that the kingdom was split, all right? And of course, then you had the running of Israel, the northern kingdom, and the running of Judah, the southern kingdom. But... Uh, and as I said, a lot of the identity of the northern kingdom was, was, was gone. But here, the Lord has shown Jeremiah a great and wonderful thing. That the man that he is talking about, this righteous one, the one that will execute judgment and righteousness in the land, this branch uh, of righteousness... Uh, uh, this one that the Lord said, for thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the, uh, the throne of the house of Israel. And we know there came a time uh, in that succession of that line uh, far as uh, going uh, through Solomon and, and his son and, and, and down the line that there, there, there came a, a point uh, to where uh, that there was a curse placed upon that northern line uh, uh, whereby uh, the Lord said, right this man childless as though he doesn't have a child for there shall not be a, a child of his uh, to prosper sitting upon uh, the throne of Israel. And of course, we know that God in His wonderful providence took care of that. And I sure don't have time to go into to, to all of that. But the point is, by Him saying here, that shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel will go into to what I call a key verse, K-E-Y, a key verse. And one that I go to a lot of times to prove that all the elect is going to be saved and live with God in glory. Romans 11, 26, for all Israel shall be saved. For the Redeemer shall come forth. <laughs> Amen. Who shall turn away ungodliness. Yeah. Oh, thank God from Jacob. Amen. So we, we, we're, we're thankful for that. All Israel shall be saved. So I tell you that this branch of righteousness... This one that fulfills this wonderful uh, and glorious thing that the Lord would show Brother Jeremiah yeah. <laughs> if he would call upon the Lord. Oh, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Savior from God, that God would send, that he would sit on the throne of the house of Israel, meaning all the elect. Yeah. All the elect, Jew and Gentile. Jew and Gentile. Not a segment, not, not, a, not, not a Judah as far as the uh, uh, elect. No, but in Israel. In Israel. <laughs> All right, the elect family of God is never, never has been and never, never will be split. It's, it's the elect. Yeah. It's the elect. Praise God. 
And I don't know if I've, I've told you here this at Macedonia or not, but it's coming across my mind, and if, if I haven't, then I, I sure want to tell you, because I told them at Mount Olive a lot of times until they finally, I think, remembered it, that whenever I use the word church, it would be a rarity, <laughs> just about in never, that I'd be referring to the elect family of God. About every time, 99.9, if, if I use the word church, I'm talking about a gospelly called out, baptized body of people. Yeah. And if I'm referring to the elect, I'll say the elect or say the elect family of God. Because there's a great distinction because I tell you that all the elect family of God, amen, will certainly never be in the gospel church. No. But they're in the elect family. Amen. Because God chose them and treasured them before the foundation of the world in Christ Jesus. And they are preserved. They are kept by the power of God. And Christ Jesus reigns over the house of Israel. And so all Israel shall be saved. This is there again going back just to make the connection in Romans 10 and 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He ain't talking about the elect family. No. Uh, he's talking about, uh, amen, uh, in the, in the, as a group. Uh, he's talking about individuals out of that elect family that are among uh, the nation of, natural nation of Israel. Uh, that they would uh, see the light. That they would be illuminated. That they'd be delivered. Uh, that they would uh, become disciples and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's just go a little bit further with this. And then I'll, I'll, I'll leave off here in Jeremiah 33. But let's get the next verse. In verse 18. Neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to kennel meat offerings and to do sacrifice continually. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying... Now, I invite you to read the rest of that on. Now, somebody's already thinking, Brother David, what in the world? Now, we, can, we understand where you've been so far, and we understand about the Lord sitting upon the throne, the house of David. Now, what in the world is this great and wonderful thing uh, that the Lord is showing Jeremiah that he did not know? That he didn't know. And I don't know that he knew this in the totality and if he understood and dotted every I and crossed every T, but it would have been enough to make him happy. It would have been enough to put him on shouting ground to know neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man or lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to kennel meat offerings and to do sacrifice continually. Do sacrifice continually. You say, preacher, how in the world are you going to deal with that now? What in the world... Does that mean in all of this context and all of this connection here? Well, it's not. And do we not believe in the priesthood of believers? Yeah. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, we could run to many verses. The priesthood of believers, the priesthood of disciples, the priesthood of those in the gospel church that offer, amen, sacrifice, amen, as the apostle Paul uh, says to them in Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Amen, the Lord is showing him that in this gospel kingdom uh, where uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, amen, this righteous one, the branch, the righteous of the Lord and this one that will uh, rule and be uh, uh, over sit upon the throne of the house of Israel uh, that he will have attendance he will have those that attend him or oh, they will be priests under their God and they will offer, amen, praise, the sacrifice of praise and the fruits of their lips and of their bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is their reasonable service. And God shows Jeremiah that it will never fail. Now, does that not go along with Ephesians 
chapter 3, the last verse there, what is it, verse 21, that says, Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now I tell you, this goes right along with it to prove that the gospel kingdom, the gospel church of the Lord Jesus Christ will be in existence, amen, until the end of time. Amen. Some words here on this earth, uh, uh, this righteous uh, uh, one of the Lord, uh, this, this righteous branch of the Lord, this one that will sit on the house, uh, that will sit on the throne of the house of David, that is in the top of the mountains, uh, that is highly exalted, uh, there will be uh, obedient disciples uh, 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 that have saved themselves uh, from the untoward generation by calling on the Lord. Uh, amen. By, by walking in that confessed way and believing in their heart and rendered of the calves of their lips and offering their body a living sacrifice yeah. unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. Isn't that good? <laughs> Amen. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good to know? And, and brethren, we can be a part of it. We can stay up. We are, but we can stay a part of it if we will. Keep hearing and doing. <laughs> Amen. If we'll keep hearing and doing his sayings that he has taught us and he has uh, told us of. Let's turn back just a couple of pages uh, in your Bible there to, to Jeremiah uh, chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. There was, a, there was a great deliverance there for Jeremiah to call on the Lord. And the Lord would show him great and mighty things that he didn't know about. And then we've just been talking about those. Now I'm not telling you that Brother Jeremiah knew as much as I've just told you. Because we're here on this side of the cross. And we've got all of these other scriptures. And we've got, all, we've got the New Testament. But I'm going to tell you, he, he knew enough... Uh, that God's and, and God's word is true, and uh, it, it was some mighty and wonderful things that He did not know, and it blessed Him, and it encouraged Him, and it illuminated Him in His His heart, in His mind, and put and put Him on shouting ground, and help Him to be able to continue on in the service of the Lord. Now, here in Jeremiah chapter twenty nine, uh, of course, verse ten, the Lord has just told him. And we've done alluded to that. You know, he knew about this and he foretold, uh, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you. All right? He knew that. But the Lord was telling him, there's some things you don't know that are glorious and grand and beyond that. We've talked about it. All right? In verse 12, he says, Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. Now, now, what is what is what is that connected with? Go back to uh, uh, verse ten. I will visit you and perform my good word towards you, and causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. What is he? What is he telling Jeremiah here? He's telling him that there is hope and that there's a future. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? There is a future. There is a hope. Then he says, Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away, because you have said the Lord hath raised uh, us up prophets in Babylon. Know that, uh, know that thus saith the Lord, the king that sitteth upon the throne of David and of all the people that dwelleth in this city, and of your brethren uh, that are gone forth with you into captivity. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send upon them the sword. In other words, those that carried them away captive. So the Lord is, is teaching him here uh, of 
of a, 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 an expected end, a, a future, and a hope. But then when we turn on over there to 33, then he said, but you call on me. Each time he tells you, call on me. Call on me. And each time uh, that, that the Lord emphasizes this, if you call upon me, I will, I will hear you, I will answer you. He said, you shall seek me and find me. Now we understand this context. This principle though I believe is, is true to all of God's people. And true uh, in the gospel day. Yeah. That if we seek the Lord, that we will find him. When you shall search for me with all your heart. Yeah. It'd be good to stay there just a little bit, a little bit longer. But I want to, I want to turn to Psalms chapter fifty. In Psalms chapter fifty, in verse fifteen, you know, there's hundreds of verses that you could go to about calling on the Lord and and having deliverance from this, that, and the other. But it all uh, boils down to light and illumination, and from darkness and. And, and revelation and understanding which, which rejuvenates the mind, the heart, encouragement. In verse 15 of, of the 50th Psalm, And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Yeah. So, many, over and over for different things to call upon the Lord. Yeah. Here he's talking about, you are in trouble. Call on the Lord. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Yeah. You see, it's all to his praise. It's all to his glory. It is certainly all to his honor. Instead of going further, there in Romans 10 when the time is practically gone. Let me just stay with that and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3 and we'll close in this. In 1 Peter chapter 3, a very misunderstood verse of Scripture among God's people in the nominal quote-unquote Christian world and even some orders that get so confused to where they believe that H2O, water, is essential in regeneration. Believe in baptismal regeneration. We have stated we don't believe in gospel regeneration. I'm stating we don't believe in water or baptismal regeneration. We believe in immediate, direct, spirit operation. Regeneration. Immediate and direct. Immediate. Just like that. Just like that. Immediate. Direct. Direct from God. Direct by the Spirit. The life-giving voice of the Son of God. The quickening. Ephesians 2 and 1. And ye hath he quickened who were dead in trespass and sin. And ye hath he quickened. Made alive. He makes alive. How? Calling. He calls. All right? That's the uh, uh, foreknow, predestinate, called. Amen. The called, the effectual call. All right. So here, though, we have uh, the Apostle Peter as he, as he is, is, is flowing along right here. In verse 18, he says, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh. But quickened by the Spirit, being raised by the Spirit. Peter said he was raised by the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost there. He said that Christ was raised by the Spirit of God. By whom also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Now those eight souls were saved by water. Them eight persons were saved by water. The same water that uh, saved eight people drowned all the rest of humanity. How did, it, uh, how did it save eight people? 
The water saved them because it floated the boat they were in. That water, they were in the ark. Genesis chapter 7 verse 1. And the Lord God called unto them from the ark, called them into the ark, called Noah and his family into the ark. God was in the ark and called them to come into the ark. Now I know God's everywhere uh, present, nowhere absent, but I want to tell you the manifestation of God was inside the ark and he called them to come into the ark. Amen, thou and thy family. And that's because that's where God had chose to save them. To preserve their lives while the, the flood was on. Alright? So, so this is how they're saved by water. This, this, has, this has no eternal consequences. This has nothing for heaven above or hell below. Right? Alright. So, so eight people, eight souls were saved by water. That's how they were saved. And the like figure were into even baptism also now, uh, doth also now save us. So there is a salvation in water baptism, but it's not for heaven. It's not for heaven. It's for deliverance. And it delivers you into the, to a local body of the gospel church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is a figure. This is an example. This is a teaching that the Apostle Peter brings in here. Wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved of water. The like figure, wherein two, even baptism, doth also now save us. That's the same salvation that Peter called upon them to save themselves from this untoward generation. And he had already told them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is what in Acts 5? The Holy Ghost is given to them that obey. So that, that's not a regeneration verse either. Amen. That, that, that's, a, that's a promise and an experience and obedience in discipleship. All right? Because we know there's no obedience involved on our part. Amen. To be saved for heaven and mortal glory. Now it is the Spirit of God that regenerates and the, and the love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. That's at the time of, re, of regeneration. We believe in spirit regeneration. But here's the promise of the Holy Ghost that is promised to those that will obey. Very plainly called in the Scripture. We read of the gifts of the Spirit to equip, to enable the saints to operate and carry on in the gospel kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says it's not to put in the way of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So water baptism that saves us in a temporal sense delivers us into the gospel body wherein, as Peter told them, in other words, save yourself from this untoward generation. In other words, Peter, the Apostle Peter was saying, what you do, you leave those untowards and you come over here to us towards. <laughs> you come over here to us that are toward. Amen. They're untoward. They're crooked. They're, they're not with the Lord. We're toward. Amen. Straight. You come over here to us. Yeah. You come over here and live with us. We'll teach you. Yeah. We'll, we'll, the gospel will illuminate you. Right. You know, I believe with all of my heart. I can't prove, I'm, I'm closing. I can't, I can't prove this by the Bible, but this is my, this is a thought, okay? This is my thought. I believe that there was people on the day of Pentecost that was saved from the destruction in Jerusalem because of their obedience in coming into the gospel kingdom and hearing the preaching of the apostles that Christ had given concerning uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and had said, when you see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, when you see these things happening, you flee from Jerusalem. You flee to the mountains. You don't be caught there in that city. You don't think they was preaching that? You don't think they was telling folks that? You don't think they were telling the Jews that and people there around Jerusalem that had become converted and disciples? Yes, they was telling them what Jesus had told them. I believe they preached what Jesus told them, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Amen. And so therefore, it was a salvation. It was a deliverance unto them 
because they heard those things and they, they were not caught within Jerusalem uh, at that time when they saw the events taking place, when they saw those signs coming about, they were out of there. Yeah. Amen. Why? They, they were with people that had the knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm about to get happy with that one now. Yeah. Amen. They were with people that had the knowledge. They were with people that had understanding and it saved them. Right. Amen. Yeah. I want to tell you, there's a salvation. There's a deliverance. It even saved their temporal lives. Right. God bless you this morning. It's my prayer. Yeah. Let's stand together.